Thank you everyone for coming for this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Akintola Akintoye from uh, Leeds Beckett University. Um, this is a great opportunity for many of us to come together this, um, this afternoon in the UK, and I'm sure you are from different countries, which in terms of the time uh, uh, position where you are, uh, some of you might be late at night, some of you early in the morning. Again, wherever you are, I would like to say thank you um, for coming for this. This particular event is a webinar organized under the banner of CIB. We have the, the CEO of uh, CIB here, who is going to say a few things later uh, about what CIB is all about and what we are trying to achieve. Uh, but here, this is organized by the CIB W122, uh, which is public-private partnership. And what we are trying to do today is just to revisit the impact of a public-private partnership and also how we can use this to be able to accelerate the development, particularly around smart city, and also in terms of sustainable infrastructure development. That is what we are trying to achieve. And I'm sure you will be, uh, you will have opportunity to contribute to that. In terms of the discussion that we are going to have, uh, uh, is about accelerating smart, um, smart city and sustainable environmental development through public-private partnership. And also we have the coordinators of public-private partnership, they are here. Uh, again, they are going to be leading on that. I have my co-coordinator, uh, uh, Professor Mwan Kumaraswamy is here and is going to be part of this, is going to be leading some, some part of this presentation. And also Professor Giovanni, from University of Washington, USA, is going to be joining us as well. Uh, it's good to see all the speakers here. They are all of them, all the four speakers, they are here. We have speaker from Hong Kong. We have from uh, Brazil, from USA, from India. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to see all of them here. Few years back, we produced this book uh, on public-private partnership, again, under the banner of CIB. And what we are trying to do there then was to look at a global review of PPP, how PPP has developed globally. We had contributions from many, many countries to be able to speak to the development in their country and what they are trying to do. And again, we know that PPP can be used to accelerate development. We know that. And there are many countries, whether you are developed country or developing countries, where you are trying to bring in PPP to be able to accelerate development and also in terms of growth, in terms of infrastructure. We think that is still there, but from our speakers, we should be able to hear from them how this can be used to be able to accelerate development and also economic growth as well, where the public and the private sector, they come together to be able to develop infrastructure. And what we are trying to do through the CIB W122 public private partnership is to look at this global development to be able to bring people together who can debate the impact of public private partnership. There are some benefits that we do see around public private partnership, and also there are some constraints and challenges that we are we do see. But how can we overcome the challenges? And also, and also how can we benefit from this? These are some of the things that we, we can discuss and also we can debate as well. Again, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this event. Um, something I also need to mention is that this is going to be recorded. Please let us remember that because we'll be able to share this information with you as well. And also not only with you, for those who will have been here and they cannot be here for one reason or the other, that information will be there for them to be able to use as a kind of resource around public-private partnership. Also, we are going to open the chat box as well, where you can put your questions, what the questions you have. We have two people that have helped us a lot to be able to organize this event. We have Liz Schofield and also Lee Donna, both of them from Liz Beckett University have helped us and they have been the contact as well 
with you around this organizing this event. So they are going to be here with us. They are, they are going to be looking at the chat box to see precisely what you have said, and then they are going to be making that available to the presenters specifically. Uh, if you have questions that you want them specific speaker to address, please put the name of the speaker there so that we know who is going to address that. Later, they are going to be reading the questions to us so that we can address some of the issues that you have raised. Please make use of the chat box a lot because we are going to be using that. So what I'm going to do presently now is to invite the Chief Executive Officer of uh, CIB, Don Ward, to say a word of welcome, and not only that, to let us know precisely what CIB is all about. I think he's in the best position to tell us what CIB is all about. Okay, Don, uh, please, can you take Well, thank you for that introduction, and may I, yes, may I add my welcome uh, to everyone to this event. My appreciation to the coordinators of CIB Working Commission W122 and to the organisers at Leeds Beckett University. Thank you for all your efforts and I hope it's a valuable session for everybody. Um, what I'll do now is uh, share my slides. I hope they're coming onto the screen any minute now. Okay. I'd just like to say a few words in recognition of our platinum anniversary, our 70th anniversary year. We're, we're, we're proud of that history. It's an important legacy, I hope, that we uh, are providing um, and which we need to build on for the next 20 years. We were formed in 1953, therefore, um, originally as Conseil International du Batiment, forgive the awful French accent, um, uh, renamed 25 years ago as the International Council for Research and Innovation in Buildings and Construction. Uh, I find it a little bit easier to think of this as the global platform for collaboration for innovation in the built environment. Um, I don't mind which version of CIB you use. This. But our origins are uh, around the post-war rebuilding of Europe uh, under the auspices of the United Nations. And um, there's just a few little landmarks recorded here, really. The first World Building Congress was held in 1959. Um, <clears throat> by the time of the 1970s and the oil crises and so on, that saw a huge growth in research in subjects like energy efficiency of buildings. Um, by the 1990s, we were into the subject of sustainability. Energy efficiency became sustainability. We launched the student chapters. Uh, scope widened more and more. Many management issues like PPP, like legal uh, issues, like procurement. Um, and then, of course, in 1920, we got the, the 2020, sorry, we got the global pandemic and that has affected uh, the way in which research is carried out, the way in which we carry out events and so on. Uh, I'd just like to give you a few highlights uh, of what we're doing these days. I think we add value for research in three different ways. First of all, and most importantly, by providing a global network for collaboration between researchers and those interested in applying research through primarily 40 of these expert working commissions, one of which you can see in action today, and they are typically running conferences or webinars like this, producing publications. And every three years, we all come together in the World Building Congress, which I'll mention at the end. The second thing we do is support tomorrow's talent. So through our student chapters, we're very keen to bring in PhD students and early career researchers into the network so that they benefit from being able to meet with their peers and with you know, the leading experts around the globe. And we campaign on issues which matter, which affect research, whether that's uh, research funding, whether it's uh, the way in which impact is measured and assessed and promoted, particularly with the industry and with governments. There are 40 working commissions, as I've mentioned. W122 is uh, it's actually the newest of all, uh, the newest but one. Uh, the newest one is People in Construction, W123. Uh, but they date back, some of these have been around for the best part of 70 years. Uh, and they really do cover topics as, as widely ranging as different uh, kinds of material, uh, management issues such as those I mentioned earlier. About half of them are addressing some aspect or another of, of sustainability, whether that's environmental impact, whether that's social impact, or whether it's economic um, performance. 
so my uh, I do encourage anyone watching who's not involved with CIB. Um, I'm sure that somewhere on that screen is your research area to some extent or another. Uh, do contact us. We're happy to connect you with those people involved. The next 70 years, um, I think you've got to be focused on on su sustainability and climate change and, and frankly, uh, you know, impact on on populations, impact on on the planet. And we've taken a lot of effort in the last two years to align all of our work, including the commissions to the sustainable development goals. And, you know, it's pretty obvious that some of these goals are directly all about our industry, whether that's sustainable goal nine or 11. But there's plenty where we've got challenges in the industry which we need to face up to and where we need further innovation to improve our, our performance. And there are plenty where the great work of our industry make a big difference, whether that's in uh, production of better hospitals, better schools, whether it, um, sewage and sanitation, um, et cetera. So I think you'd find that pretty much all of our work impacts on the sustainable in, in one way or another. So I do think this is a fantastic alignment for us. It takes us back to our roots in the United Nations and I commend these the goals and a mapping towards these goals and an understanding of how anyone's work is contributing to them as a great way of communicating what we do uh, beyond beyond our own small communities. Let me close by highlighting the World Building Congress held in Melbourne in 2022, very much as a 50-50 online uh, in-person event because of the legacy of um, COVID. The 23rd one we hope will be much more face-to-face. -face. We're targeting for there to be over 700 people there and it'll be in Indiana near uh, between Chicago and Indianapolis uh, in May 2025. I hope to see as many of you as possible there. There's more information on our website and the call for abstracts will open towards the end of November. So not long now, get your thinking caps on in terms of the paper you want to submit for that conference. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand back to the chairman. OK. Uh, thank you, uh, Don. Uh, we now go to the presentation again. Thank you for that. I think for many of our guests, they know precisely what CIB is all about, what we are trying to achieve and the goals around the sustainable development goals as well. How we are addressing that now we have the the presenters. Uh, the this is going to be anchored by Moan, who is going to be leading on that. So Moan, uh, I leave you to that. Hello, thank you, Akin. I, I hope uh, everyone can hear me and I don't know whether you can see me or not, but if you can't see me, it's no big loss. Uh, so uh, welcome and good day to 71 people who are already participating and we expect more because more have registered, um, but we need to move on. We are actually about uh, five, six minutes late, Akin. So I think we will, uh, unless you say otherwise, uh, Akin, we will uh, proceed with the same 15 minutes per speaker and you may decide uh, what to do about whether you're going to cut down the Q&A or the this panel discussion or whether we are going to extend. So we have three options by extend by five to seven minutes, whatever. OK, so without further ado, I would like to invite first speaker. The bios are already um, seen by those who registered or could have been seen. And uh, I'm told that they're available um, on this team's meeting, uh, if one really wants to see them, just send a Q&A. And talking about Q&A, anyone who um, comes up with a question during the presentation uh, is welcome to type them into the Q&A and these will be collected and we will uh, answer them during the Q&A um, session time later, as many as possible. Um, so that will be a different procedure. So those are the house rules and uh, we will now call upon the first speaker, uh, Professor Albert Chan from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And uh, so happens that I'm also in Hong Kong at the moment. So <laughs> this is just across the harbor from me. And welcome Albert. And I can see the slides are loading. And over to you Albert. 
Certainly. Uh, good day again, and thank you, uh, Professor Mohan, uh, for introducing me, and for thank you for your kind words. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to be here to share some of the information uh, with uh, colleagues in uh, CIB. The topic that I'd like to share with you is um, an integrated, optimized approach to risk assessment in public-private partnerships, the potency of systems thinking. In fact, uh, it's based on um, a piece of research work um, of my uh, PhD student, Dr. Bridget Ashen. Uh, she completed her PhD degree last year, and she is now a full-time academic in uh, Glasgow Calistonian uh, University in the UK. All right, um, let me begin by showing you uh, the outline of the presentation and uh, because the time is quite tight, so I go straight so to talk about some um, the main content. Now we believe that you know uh, we all are practitioners and researchers in TPP, and we just uh, understand that you know risk management in PPP is absolutely important, and uh, proactive risk management will enhance project viability and reduces uncertainties. And this, although it's a very familiar topic, and the one that I'd like to introduce to you today is um, uh, what uh, we consider a rather innovative approach, because uh, we believe effective risk management is absolutely necessary for the successful implementation of PPP. Now, the traditional wisdom uh, tells us that risk management systematically entails first, identification, Second, assessment and prioritization. Third, allocation and sharing. And um, last but not least, uh, treatment and mitigation. So these are some very fundamental concepts about risk management. And um, however, uh, we believe that you know risks are allocated to further define the roles of project actors. Hence, efficiency in assessment is absolutely critical to ensure project success. Now, despite some the familiarity of uh, risk um, assessment and risk management, the knowledge domain is characterized by several approaches to risk management and assessment. However, these methods tackle the risk factors autonomously. And uh, what we like to introduce is practical experiences uh, tells us that project risk in PPP do not occur independently, but rather uh, in reality, uh, they have rippling effects or causal sequence. So instead of looking at risk factors individually, what we are proposing here is why don't we look at risk in holistically and uh, try to identify and understand um, the causal relationship of each an individual risk factor uh, so that we can have a much better um, understanding. Because we believe that project risks are interrelated, hence the evaluation of risk relationships improves and provides a better estimation of risk impacts. And uh, therefore, it is important to consider the dynamic nature between risk um, when assessing them. So instead of looking at them independently and individually, we call for a big picture, what we call the system thinking, and uh, which reveals interconnectedness, synthesis, and causality, uh, which um, in other words means a cause and effect relationship. System thinking is described as the best and ideal approach to realistic modeling of project complexities uh, such as risks. So what is uh, system thinking in risk management? It involves recognizing interactions in interrelationships amid project risks. System thinking in risk assessment provides a blueprint of the causal sequence of risk factors. Therefore, it provides a roadmap for investigation and enables efficient risk treatment and mitigation strategies as practical as possible. Now, um, in terms of methodology, the integration of system thinking and the typical risk assessment methods optimizes 
and effectively defines the risk behavior and impact. By and large, um, this optimized approach consists of two stages. The first one is autonomous assessment, which is uh, a very typical risk assessment approach. And method adopted is risk significant index. And the second stage is the systematic assessment. Method used is interpret uh, in interpretive structural modeling and mind map. Now, a part of me, mind map is a French term, but then, you know, later on, I will describe them in uh, um, uh, further and greater details. Now, um, this is the what we call the approach, um, the stage one. Um, first thing is the autonomous assessment. Typically, uh, we'll find out the risk significant index uh, by way of likelihood and severity. And the uh, multiplication um, of the likelihood and severity will give us the index. And then we assess the risk impact evaluation by means of the RI, the risk index. And uh, during the process, we uh, compute the RI, uh, which is uh, the product between uh, likelihood and severity, and we just take a square root out of it. And uh, from there, we can identify the critical risks, and which is, in fact, uh, the most um, common method of risk assessment and risk management. But then we don't stop by there. Uh, we move on to the second stage, which we call the systematic assessment. And uh, we based on the interpretive structural modeling and the mind map approach, we managed to uh, find out and ascertain risk relationships and behavior. And as I mentioned earlier, risk will not happen in isolation. Uh, they do have um, uh, the rippling effect. One risk factor may have an impact on the others. And so uh, this approach will enable us to have a holistic picture to understand the causal relationship of these risk factors. And we also call upon the expert judgment. And at the end, we managed to identify the his, uh, risk hierarchy. Now, I would like to use a case scenario to illustrate how this uh, new approach can be implemented. Uh, this is based on a case study from the Sino-Africa Transnational PPP between uh, Ghana and Nigeria, uh, in which we have um, um, resource to uh, over 170 respondents, and uh, we managed to identify 33 risk factors. And from the stage one, we uh, uh, adopt the normalization approach for those um, um, having um, the uh, loading over uh, 0 0.5. Uh, we consider them as the critical factors and we managed to reduce uh, 33 risk factors into 22, which we call the risk critical factors. In stage two, we apply the risk relationship assessment and the MIMAC approach. Now, this is how we uh, did um, the systematic uh, risk assessment. Now, uh, we uh, resourced to 13 experts and uh, from which uh, we identified the 22 critical risk factors. And moving on next is to use the structural self iteration modeling, uh, which will enable us to um, adopt the VIXO approach and uh, which by and large is uh, um, um, to convert those uh, opinion into a matrix. And moving on to stage three is to develop the reachability matrix and transitivity check. And lastly is uh, to enable us to develop the level partitioning. Now, pardon me for um, moving on a little bit quick because time is not on our side. And this slide will illustrate some um, the process of the um, computation and also the results of the computation, uh, which enable us to define the 22 risk factors into three levels. The first level is project implementation uh, risk factors. The second one is regulatory and political governance. And the third level is the force majeure. And um, um, I, uh, one point I'd like to highlight is uh, the higher the level, the higher risk influence. 
In fact, um, by applying the MIMAC uh, analysis, it further enables us to define um, whether the risks are independent in nature or linkage in nature, autonomous or dependent. By having a, a four quadrant approach, uh, we, it will enable the project uh, managers to have a much clearer understanding of the risks and the inherent um, implication. So um, this method uh, incorporated expert judgment and establishes direct and indirect risk causal sequence and critical risk factors are determined and the analysis further describe risk behavior to facilitate practical solution. And feedback relationships can be further analysis and by having this uh, level partitioning, um, it will enable us uh, to develop a hierarchical, hierarchical structure for risk prioritization so that we can put more resources on the higher level risks. And it provides a template for early warning signs and uh, the method determines uh, the root causes as well. For instance, the studies finding identified force majeure as a root cause where COVID-19 is a practical example. By way of conclusion, uh, we believe that you know system thinking for risk management in PPP is the way to go, and there's a lot of prospects in digital era. Machine learning and AI applications can be further developed to automate risk analysis and real-time monitoring with digital technologies for early detection, and also by uh, adopting the advanced modeling of systems to create more sophisticated model of uh, complex risk assessment rather than just relying on the autonomous approach. And the data-driven insights can enable us to understand risk systems behavior and the dynamics through big data analytics. And it also improves uh, scalability, ability to handle more risk systems and ultimately it enhanced collaboration amongst project parties in risk management. So system thinking um, as a result of this research indicates that it can provide and offer a valuable blueprint for risk management in PPP that goes beyond a reductionist approach. The application of system thinking in risk assessment is important to resolve the practical complexities in risk management of PPP particularly in smart construction and uh, for future technology. So um, that is um, the stuff that I'd like to share with colleagues today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albert, um, for finishing on time and giving us a knowledge packed presentation, getting across all your points so well. Thank you very much, Albert. And now moving on to the next speaker. So moving from Hong Kong to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, another good friend, Babak Ashuri from Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech as we all know it. Again, um, no introduction, he needs no introduction and you've got the bios if you want to see recent details and updates. Over to you, Babak. All right, I, I'm sharing my screen now. I think you should be able to see that. Yeah, everybody. Yes, we can. Yeah. Good. All right, and you hear me. Yeah, uh, good morning for our friends uh, on this side of the world and good afternoon, good evening to our friends in Europe and Asia. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the invitation, Mohan and uh, Don, for the introduction. Uh, so, I believe my PhD student, uh, my senior PhD student, Hong Jin Oh should be on the call. So this is a research we have done over the past year with the Center for Equity and uh, Decision and in for the Transportation is one of the centers for uh, university transportation centers that the US Department of Transportation uh, supports. So the, the topic is we wanted to show how 
public-private partnership, the P3 as we call it on this side of the pound or PPP on the other side, had, can be used to enhance development and deployment of the smart technology. And particularly in the US, there is a gap in broadband. There is a gap to have access to high speed internet, uh, particularly the situation considering the vast amount of land the country has and a lot of that going into the urban areas and uh, rural areas sometimes, you know, uh, not receiving the access to internet at the level they're supposed to. Uh, and what you would expect from a a big advanced country and big advanced economy like United States. But uh, having said that, without of, you know, this would be a sweet spot for some of the public-private partnership forms. And by the way, uh, some of you might be familiar with the infrastructure bill. Uh, that's the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, passed the Congress in 2021. And part of that, about $65 billion investment into the broadband, national broadband initiatives across uh, the United States. So that has been the money provided by the federal governments and in form of you know, different types of grants for the states, municipalities, counties, and uh, local governments. So we see that also in a hierarchical order from the federal to a state to the communities and uh, that also adds some complexity to designing an appropriate business model. So certainly there is a there is a gap here. But just talking about the broadband infrastructure, I know some of you might be familiar. We are talking about the smart infrastructure here, a smart cities, backbone of the smart cities, and also a smart economy. So we certainly have a cross-border network. This is some uh, format of you know uh, under the sea for example, fiber optic cables or satellite connections. This is connections that we would have across the, the globe to have the backbone of the international and global uh, kind of you know, network, high speed network. And then each country or each region, they have their own national backbone. So these are sort of, you know, very high level public infrastructure at the federal level, government level would take care of that, you know, getting into the contract with uh, uh, stakeholders involved in that, that level. But what we basically talk here, and that's usually the, the parts that unfortunately not everybody would benefit from this uh, international and national backbone is the middle mile or the last mile. The, these are the things that uh, you and I would deal with that. You know, at the state level, for example, they need to have the middle mile network, the ones that usually route uh, routed through the state uh, highway systems or uh, into interstate highway system. So these are sort of the middle mile network. And then the ones that uh, we get a connection, we get a cut from that middle mile that brings us to the home, bring us to the university that we are, for example, or bring us to uh, a place of business or any other activities that might happen. So primarily we are talking about how we can address equity, how we can address access to the broadband for uh, communities through investment in some middle mile and last mile network. So in our research, we focus on that. We talk to uh, states, we talk to the cities, we talk to um, uh, people who are involved in the middle mile construction or last mile and, and see how that model uh, could work. So um, most of you here or all of you should be familiar with the public private partnership models. So in this case, the challenge is yet another infrastructure system, yet another things that you may want to consider that as utilities, for example, like you know gas or electricity or any other type of utilities, you would have this significant deployment cost and somebody has to take care of that in lieu of receiving uh, a subscription fee. Like you and I pay X amount of dollars per month for access to certain uh, speed of internet. So that's a risky business and that's something 
uh, we, we would like to see how we can address that. Because for instance, if you are in a place that enough subscribers are there, I mean, for instance, you know, if you are in in place like New York City with about 10 million population and and almost the same amount of people visiting that throughout the uh, the uh, throughout every every uh, every week or every month, so you would have a big customer base. So everybody wants to have a piece of that market. Everyone wants to be there. So that's why you see. Uh, players in the US like you know AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, they're all over the markets that are already uh, a lot of businesses there, a lot of people there. But once the population drops, once the number of business or the level of the economic activities uh, drop, then you would have a situation that subscription down the road is not good enough, it's not profitable, and it's not the priority of the private sector to take that. So the, here is the, the place that public has to stop, step in. And what we are arguing here, probably a smart public investment and utilizing the resources and the skill sets that the private sector has would be uh, something that beneficial for the end users in this case. And like any other type of uh, uh, public private partnership, we are dealing with many and many stakeholders here, several stakeholders, and each of them comes with their own sort of you know, purview. When you have a state and federal, they are regulators. They are forming sort of you know, antitrust law. For example, they want to provide enough competition in the market. They want to uh, to make sure there is no monopoly in the market in that way. And later on, I will talk about that. Unfortunately, a lot of places in the US, a lot of homes or businesses, you only have one, possibly two choices. Very, very few people in the US would have more than two choices to get, you know, uh, internet at uh, at their at at home. Uh, or at their place of business, so the sort of the the the, the cable ones, but there are uh, they are not enough. You know, you you're only looking at the local governments because the middle mile and almost uh, everything that are related to the last mile happens at the local governments. So they come with their own regulations, with their own way of doing business. Part of that is. Uh, acquisition of the right of way, for example, or having access for easement or uh, access for maintenance of the cables or anything like that. So th those are other parties involved into that. And uh, here is the difference in the US compared to some other countries, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the property right is in the Constitution in the United States, and all the states have equivalent of that. So when you're looking at this, right of way issue, then you would realize, yeah, I mean, there is um, there's so much you can do. You have to have a fair negotiation about the fair market value with the stakeholders there in order to build your network. So then you have your contractors, the network construction contractors, then those who are designed and built. Uh, a lot of them are design builders in this area. They are familiar, they're engineers. Uh, and they they get in some form of you know EPC type contract in order to build uh, uh, lay down the foundation to build the conduit and the equipment and all of that. And when you get to the last mile, you need you need operators and you need ISP, you know the internet service providers, which the you and I are uh, inter our interface is the ISP providers. So. The issue is at each level, what kind of you know, competition you would like to have, what kind of efficiency you would like to bring to the table, and definitely how you go with the funding and uh, funding gap, addressing the funding gap or addressing the financing issues. So the research framework and the paper, by the way, published by uh, Journal of Legal Affairs and Dispute Resolution, uh, that's the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers journal and uh, Hunjin, at, uh, Hunjin and I have made some presentation here and there based on the outcome of this research. But, you know, I would highly encourage you to take a look at that or if you want, you know, you can drop me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to share a copy with you. But what we did, we used a sort of a case study approach and interview base. Uh, we would uh, we had uh, after the literature review, we have uh, a structure 
two things, you know, one was the survey, which would be another publication coming up on this study. But the other things after the survey was done was detailed interview. So we, we had a structured interview with the stakeholders at the local communities, at the public entities and uh, private sectors who are involved in that type of, you know, business. So uh, the, the findings, we summarize that as several business model that can be used. But let's review the, the issues. There are several issues that we understand through the content analysis of the, the interview uh, transcripts. The, the issues related to the partnership, that's a key point that as far as that public private partnership, we always talk about put the partnership back to the deal which deals with the risk allocation and risk identification. So we have mechanism in terms of uh, how we can allocate the risk, whether it's the design and construction or permitting risk. So we have a risk, risk checklist for broadband projects uh, in case somebody might be interested in that so they can uh, look it up in our, in our paper so they can see what kind of risk checklist would be available and that risk register would be the first step to assessment and allocation of the risk, the funding and financing part of that and the expectation that both party would have. One thing I need to say that the projects always have a chance to become more successful than anticipated. We can estimate the demand, but we are not perfect in that estimation. So there's always good to have some sort of, you know, cap uh, and sort of, you know, revenue sharing after a certain point. So and then, of course, up, up front, for the first few years in order to build that revenue, there might be some issues around that so the public can get into that and uh, issue some minimum revenue guarantees. A lot of you know, market dynamics, which affects the price, which affects the price to the end customers. Uh, I'm not going to everything, but definitely the sustainability and impact of the business model and the competitive landscape has been coming. And by the way, pay attention to that. This is evolving market. Uh, every year we would see some new technologies. So another advantage of public private partnership is to bring the private partner to know the latest technology and decides on the use of the latest technology. So you don't want to uh, stick with something that belonged to five years ago. So uh, often when you're looking at the public sector, unfortunately, a lot of those, you know, uh, stick with the technologies that are not up to the to the level that it should be. And it's uh, the private sector, you know, we we can design some P3 models with the clauses that says it has to be a state of the, the art. The other attributes that we use to build the uh, business model and we came up with a 10 type of business model. It's about the technology layers, whether they're vertically integrated or more of a horizontal, the funding source, the sharing between public and private, whether it's open access or not. For instance, many cities like San Francisco, for example, they had that open access because they believe it's the backbone of their uh, economy and also their backbone of their uh, support for any uh, group of people that are enfranchised, you know, sort of, you know, under util, uh, underserved communities in, in particularly major cities. Uh, so he, I'm not getting into the details. So we came up with the 10 business models uh, that we noticed and there are case studies around each of them, except one that could be potentially on paper exists, but uh, we haven't seen any examples of that in the US. So as I said, the attributes here is how you fund the project. Some of them are totally funded by the private sector. Some of them are totally funded by the public. But we have jointly funding of the projects, which is, you know, uh, a sweet spot for a lot of this public private partnership. Then then we're talking about the ownership. On one extreme, you have a business model that completely uh, funded by private and owned by the private uh, entities but we have some joint ownership and then on the another extreme is completely owned by the, the private operation. Also uh, extent of operation, we have the spectrum of jointing uh, joint operations or all the way public versus the private. And then whether the project has any mandate as far as the open access, because once you have the open access, it affects your future revenue. And here are some examples here and then the technology layer, whether 
um, the vertical integration all the way, or is anything that is only a part of that goes into the, the place. But the, the sweetest spot for the public private partnership is to find a way to jointly fund the project because you want your private sector has a skin in the game. So you want to see some equity at risk in the project. So that's a good good way to move forward. But at the same time, you want to make sure that they understand they're on the uh, there is revenue down the road. And then there is another issue about the ownership of that, whether middle mile or last mile. On the last mile, you can rely more on the pub private sector, but middle mile is more that the states and communities can do that because they, they own a lot of the assets already in place, or they can use the conduit that they can lease to the private sector. So it looks like, you know, the the best way on the middle mile is to for a states or a cities take care of that, but for the last mile rely on the uh, private sector. So the private sector comes and um, uh, sort of you know lease that middle mile, and then the network operation and uh, ISP. It looks like the private sector is better in terms of customer service, in terms of running promotion, in terms of uh, making the customers happy overall because that's their business and that's let them compete in that front. But middle mile is a lot of risk as far as, you know, utilities coordination, railroad coordination, uh, underground condition, design and construction issues that that would be better served by the uh, public sector and more of a public sector involvement. Overall, sorry, you know, several. Sorry to interrupt uh, yeah. Baba, but we are a little over time so yeah this is my could... last slide mohan yeah oh, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm done almost done yeah so uh, the risk factors that you know i told you about that to summarize you know of course the ownership there would be issues around that uh, you want as on a public sector you want to make sure the market is not getting into the uh, as far as competition monopoly you know you want to stay away from that so as much as you can open up, particularly on the last mile. The CapEx and the CapEx at risk, that would be another major issues. The revenue risk would be uh, would be something, you know, how you can come up with the revenue sharing strategies. And of course, there are some markets that you already have some incumbents and there is a challenge for addressing that part. And of course, this is a new industry in the US, relatively new in terms of uh, deployment at this scale, particularly in the rural areas, which may not have that workforce. So we find out a lot of, you know, workforce training could help. Uh, by that, you know, thanks for the opportunity. Here is my contact and please reach out to me or Hunjin and we will be happy to talk further about that. Maybe we ask some questions at the end of this presentation too. But yeah, thanks CIB for having us. Thanks, Babak, that was great. And uh, sorry to have interrupted, but uh, I mean, I wish we had no, another no, five minutes. Yeah, so it, it was a it was a very interesting and relevant, I would say, case study. So thanks for that. I'm sure there'll be questions on this uh, particular aspects. Thanks for giving us that example. And uh, over to the next speaker, another good friend. And uh, would have been my neighbor, except that I came over to Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we were neighbors on the same corridor not too long ago when I was visiting IIT. <laughs> so over to Ashwin, uh, Professor Ashwin Mahalingam from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mohan, and thank you so much uh, uh, CIB and Akin and Don and all of you for inviting me here. First of all, it was a pleasure to listen to Albert and Babak, and uh, I'm happy to share a uh, few of my slides. My presentation is a little bit different in the sense, I'm not going to present uh, research like um, uh, Babak and, um, uh, and Albert did, or in other words, I'm not going to present a single research paper. I'm going to present a few thoughts that come from, from multiple uh, you know, research papers. That, uh, and the topic I'm going to talk about is on sustainability and PPP, sustainability, uh, sort of sustainable cities, smart cities, and so on. Um, and this is also very topical because just a few days ago on uh, Saturday, uh, my university, the Indian Institute of Technology Madras, just launched a new school of sustainability, which uh, currently I've been asked to head as well. So this is now front and center of the way we think about things. So 
uh, PPPs to me are a tool that can be used in a variety of situations. So, uh, you know, they've been used to build infrastructure, they've been used to provide services, and they can certainly be used to bring about uh, greater sustainability. The question is not, are PPPs um, uh, let's say uh, appropriate for sustainability. The question is, what do we have to do or what kinds of PPPs might be appropriate under what kinds of circumstances and so on? So I want to see if I can answer very briefly three issues, right? First of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we've tried to bring sustainability into PPPs in the past. Second, I want to flip it around and say, uh, so, uh, you know, earlier we had PPPs and we were trying to make them sustainable. Now we have sustainability projects for which we would like to bring together PPPs and what are some of the considerations. And then finally, um, you know, how do we sort of look at the sustainability of PPPs? So these are three separate threads relating to sustainability that I wanted to talk about. So the first one, sustainability in PPPs. Uh, so PPPs have been around for for several centuries, actually, I know since the 80s, uh, there, there, there's a new Philip for PPPs fueled by things like the private finance initiative in the UK, taken up by several countries along around the world, including India, the United States, etc. Um, and one of the things we've and PPPs have been used to build roads and bridges and power plants and prisons and you know, uh, you know what. So one of the, the key issues has been while we are want to bring private finance to the table to build all of this infrastructure. How do we actually ensure uh, that we also bring sustainability in? And there have been a few efforts that, that have been undertaken. Um, one that I'd like to sort of highlight as an example is this notion of the equator principles that a number of banks put together. So a number of banks came together, I think in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and said that uh, lenders had the, the greatest responsibility to ensure sustainability in PPPs. And the idea was that they would put together a certain set of principles which projects had to comply with if those projects wanted to apply for uh, you know, project financing or funding. And those conditions would ensure that environmental sustainability was taken care of, social sustainability was taken care of, and so on. Uh, right? And the, the idea was that banks would not lend to projects that did not meet these uh, considerations, or perhaps that the lending rates would be higher for relatively less sustainable projects than they would be for more sustainable projects, right? So uh, this was one among a series of approaches that people tried to bring in to address sustainability in PPPs. And so they were essentially taking existing PPPs and saying, if you're going to build a road, how do we make sure that it's sustainable? If you're going to build a hydroelectric power plant, how do we ensure that it's going to become sustainable? And these were some of the levers that were used. But I'm not quite sure if these were particularly successful. The equator principles continue to remain on paper, but there have been issues with how you enforce them. Um, you know why banks should sign up to this in the first place, whether they are robust enough in terms of actually specifying or rejecting projects that meet a certain threshold and things like that. So this area, I would say, has been a lot of thought has gone into it with regards to sustainability in PPPs. Um, not quite sure if the results match the expectations, right? But moving forward today, we're looking at the opposite. We're saying we want to develop sustainably. We want buildings to be more sustainable. We want streets to be more sustainable. We want energy supply to be more sustainable. Uh, and given this, how do we bring in uh, the private sector? And in, in some sense, I don't think it really matters because as long as there is a bankable project, the private sector will come in. So the private sector is per perfectly happy to come in and build a coal fired power plant. But if the economics work out, they're probably going to be perfectly happy in coming and building, uh, uh, you know, a solar installation or a hydroelectric power plant or whatever it is, right? So fundamentally, uh, bringing the private sector in for sustainability is not uh, a, a particular challenge. The challenge is once you bring in the private sector, how do you ensure uh, the sustainability of what you want to develop? Um, you know, public-private partnerships primarily achieve their objectives if those objectives are clearly defined and are quantifiable, right? So in the area of sustainability, there are now several tools and technologies that are available that allow us to quantify uh, the impact or the outcome that we wish to receive with regards to sustainability. So I've got three images on the, on the slide here. The leftmost image is essentially uh, ways in which you compute 
a carbon footprint for a project during the construction, during the operations. So if you're going to build again a hospital or a prison or whatever it is, um, there's a certain amount of carbon that goes into the building of that facility by view of the materials that you use, the construction methods that you use. Uh, and there is a certain amount of carbon that you're likely to emit based on the operations of the facility, based on the kind of energy that you will use and so on. And um, a carbon foot tools like life cycle analysis and so on allow us to measure our uh, carbon footprint and allow us to then set certain standards and benchmark that the private sector that could be tied to the revenue that the private sector receives that ensures that the private sector will take all means possible to reduce their carbon footprint to something that would allow for maximum uh, profitability. Uh, in the center, we have this notion of what's called urban metabolism, which is a fascinating idea, just like we have human metabolism. The idea is that uh, and you know humans consume a certain amount of resources. Uh, agglomerations like cities and towns and villages also consume resources in terms of electricity, in terms of water, in terms of food, etc. And urban metabolism is a framework that allows you to understand how much of all of this is flowing through uh, a city or a town or a village or a project and uh, allows you to then set certain benchmarks in terms of what is uh, what is allowable and what is not. And if something exceeds what is allowable, then there can be financial ramifications to ensure that the private sector does a sustainable job. And the graphic on the right is something called the planetary boundaries framework, which talks about nine boundaries um, that or, or nine parameters uh, that would ensure the safety of our planet and the boundaries to which you can actually start developing before you, you start uh, you know, harming those parameters or lead to, leading to a situation where there is irre irrevocable change that you are precipitating, uh, right? And so all of these are various ways in which we can start measuring our sustainability impact and putting it into the PPP agreement as a uh, as a responsibility of the private partner. And these targets are then again related to uh, the financial sustainability of the project. And so I think these are things that we have to think through more in terms of looking at uh, how PPPs can be used for sustainability, right? And the third thing that I want to touch upon uh, before I close is that, you know, we've looked at sustainability in PPPs, uh, sustain PPPs for sustainability, but once you've awarded a PPP and assuming that you've you've sort of taken into account all of these environmental measures and you've sort of put them into your uh, into your performance indicators, the KPIs for the project, and you've tied these to the potential revenue and the risks of the private operator. Um, how can you ensure that the agreement that you've signed continues to sustain over a period of time? And this now comes back to some research that several of my PhD students have worked with in the past, which is how do you deal with uncertainties that PPPs will face? over a long period of time. Again, a simple example is you have predicated your PPP on a certain kind of input uh, that you think you know, on a certain kind of fuel source. But over a period of time, policy might change and that fuel source may no longer be available and might be then replaced by an alternative fuel source. Uh, what happens to the PPP in those kinds of situations? Right? How do PPPs deal with a variety of uncertainties? These could be natural uncertainties. Climate change, of course, is the big one related to sustainability. Economic uncertainties related to the market, political change, things like that. And also the evolution of, uh, you know, of uh, technology. Right. So, for instance, if you have a road that's built and you have more electric vehicles, how do you induce the private sector to come in and put in more charging stations on the road, given that there are now more electric vehicles that will be using that that road? Right. And that's an extra investment that the private sector has to make post award. So how do you sort of deal with it? And the answer to this uh, through a lot of our research is through what we call the two A's alignment and adaptability. Alignment essentially talks about see PPP has a couple of very critical interfaces. There is an interface between the project and the outside world, um, and the outside world is not necessarily on the same page as the project. And very often you have stakeholder conflicts because projects and stakeholders do not see eye to eye. Second, even within the project, the public and the private sector often have differing goals and incentives. And therefore, it's important to bring about what we call relational and organizational governance strategies to ensure that the project, the, the project organization and the stakeholders are on the same page and the public and the private sector are on the same page to ensure the sustainability of PPPs. Because if, once everyone is on the same page, if you want to make a change to the contractual agreement because of a force majeure condition or some uh, is changing eventuality in the future, 
then it becomes possible because everyone is working towards the project. So there are a series of strategies that we will that we would sort of uh, look at with regards to bringing about alignment that will ensure the sustainability of projects. And the second is to bring about more adaptability and flexibility into PPP so that they can deal with the changing world. And this is extremely important with regards to sustainability because things are changing quite rapidly. Global temperatures are changing. This is having a huge impact. The, the warmer it is, uh, the, uh, you know, the, or the hotter it is, the more a road, for instance, will start developing cracks, the more maintenance that it will need, and the more it will mess with the original economics of the project, right? And therefore, there have to be mechanisms to allow projects to reset in the face of these kinds of climate emergencies, right? And essentially, there are three approaches to this. One is to automatically code in adjustments into a project. Uh, for instance, to say if the uh, average mean temperature is above a certain amount for a certain period of time, then the private sector is entitled to a, a slight an additional expense in terms of major maintenance of, of roadways, right? And so these are sort of fixed uh, things that are put into the contract if then clauses that allow you to adjust the contract uh, in the case in the in the face of eventualities. And this works when you can predict the uncertainty ahead of time. Uh, another option is to have something called a real option, which is the right but not the obligation of either the private sector or the public sector to change the terms of the contract. So, for instance, you're building a desalination plant, but because of, of uh, rising sea levels, your water intake uh, you know, might need to be sort of changed to a different location. And so can uh, and it may not necessarily happen automatically because there is some amount of discretion involved. Can one party be given the option? Can the private sector, for instance, be given the option of being able to extend uh, the duration of the project or something like that in exchange for extra capital expenditure in changing the intake of water for their desalination plant and so on? Uh, and finally, if none of these work, then you have what we call renegotiated uh, settlements where you know we have committees that you put into the contract ahead of time that look at some of these climate eventualities and uh, have the authority to open the contract uh, multilaterally and address uh, address these issues right so in other words um, i just want to sort of stop there with with all of these thoughts and sort of summarize by saying when we look at sustainability and ppps there are multiple dimensions um, you know, are we looking at existing projects and trying to bring sustainability into them? Uh, and though there are a set of considerations there, are we looking at sustainability related projects and ways in which we want to hold the public sector, a private sector accountable to those sustainability metrics, in which case it's very important to put in these kinds of metrics and irrespective, how do you sustain the PPP? And that's only possible if you have contracts that can adapt and organizational arrangements that are aligned that allow you to leverage this ability to adapt so that everyone is working sitting around the table and not across the table as a practitioner once once told me and i think if we can take into account these kinds of uh, you know strategies and, and mitigations and safeguards i don't think there is any reason why we can't move towards a more sustainable world through the use of public private partnerships, right? So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your indulgence. CIB, Mohan and others, thank you for the invitation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, once in the presentation set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashwin. That was great. You got across so much in so little time, all right? And uh, really it, it was, as you said, a presentation with a difference. And you covered the three dimensions of sustainability that you got across so well. Thank you very much, Ashwin. And uh, now we move on to a, another presentation. In fact, all the presentations have come from uh, different flavors and given us different uh, uh, facets of PPP, if you like. And the fourth one, I'm sure, is going to be just so because it's from moving from India to Brazil and it's going to be from a practitioner, uh, Dr. Leonardo Grillo. And he's based in Brazil and he's in charge. He's, he's, he's now in industry um, and he's in charge of uh, very, very interesting prison projects, which I'm sure he's going to tell you about. So over to you, Leonardo. OK, it's a presentation about the PPP in the prison system, a case study in Brazil. Context, concessions have been used since the 19th century in Brazil. More recently, governments have passed the laws to enable the use of concessions and PPPs in economic and social infrastructure projects. Last week, federal government, uh, federal Supreme Court, denounced 
rights of uh, violations in the prison system and proposing the elaboration of a national plan for the prison system, Brazilian prison system, within six months. Therefore, PPTs may have a whole a role to play in the evolution, in the modernization of the Brazilian prison sector. Over, uh, overview of the project. It's a single case study. It's a PPP in the prison sector. It's a typical DPFOM model in a 30 year contract. Um, the bidding process took place in December 2008. The contract was uh, signed in June 29. The, the first unit was commissioned in January 2013. The PPP complex is composed by three prison units that house up to 2,164 inmates. The project has, the, the concession that has about 700 employees and about 220 police officers, officers work in the project. Let's uh, talk about the responsibility matrix of the project. The private partner is responsible for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of the project. The internal, uh, internal prisoner movement and monitoring, rehabilitation programs, and implementation of a project infrastructure, access roads, uh, roads water supply, sewage treatment. On the other hand, public partner, is responsible for the maintenance of the order and discipline, application of disciplinary actions, inmate classification, security of the perimeter of the prisons, external prisoner movements, contract supervision and management. In Brazil, police power is reserved to the state government and cannot be transferred to the private sector. The design of the facilities is very functional, suitable for use, compliant with legal and contractual requirements, and carries out a lot of uh, technological innovations. The design is focused on life cycle cost management. We use stainless, uh, stainless steel furniture and toilets, for, for instance. And the project it uses a lot of technologies, such as elect electronic actuation for doors and showers, modern CCTV system, cell phone jammers, walk-through metal detectors or scanners, also, interesting point of the project is the training of personnel in techniques such as handcuffing, body language, signals, and intelligence techniques, techniques for communicating with prisoners, training of building and forestry firefighting. We have almost uh, about 100 volunteer firefighters trained annually. Catering in a prison is also a, a major issue. We produce about 10,000 meals a day in our central services unit. We employ about 90 people and 25 inmates in the central kitchen. The concessionaire is also responsible for personal care and hygiene items delivered to the inmates. Concessionaire is also responsible for health care and the provision of legal services 
in partnership with the Public Defender's Office. A major responsibility of the concessionaire is the provision of education programs for the inmates in different levels, elementary education, technical, vocational education, and also higher education. In 2000, in 2019, almost 70% of eligible inmates were involved in educational programs against 10% average in Brazil. Concessionaire is also responsible for work programs. In 2019, almost 48% of eligible inmates were engaged in work activities in our prison units against a national average of 13%. The PPP project has also a very comprehensive accountability. The PPP payment mechanism is linked to an availability and performance measurement system validated by an independent auditor. And the, the project has the supervision of the granting authority, the state auditor, human rights office, public defender's office, state attorney's office, legislative chamber, criminal system judges, etc. And the company has been audited twice a year by companies such as Grant Thornton, BDO, Ernest Young. So the level of accountability is very high. The, the concessionaire has put in place a compliance program since 2017. And the, the project has received, uh, received a lot of uh, awards. The PPP has been listed among the top 40 PPPs in emerging markets by IFC and was considered the best project of Brazil in 2018 in the PPP awards and conference. According to the one of the most famous magazines in Brazil, our project is an exception, but should be the rule. Some results of this uh, single case study in the prison sector in Brazil. PPPs have an important role to play in the evolution of the Brazilian prison sector. Our case study suggests that PPP can lead to both efficiency and quality gains for the provision of services in the prison, the prison sector. Fiscal and budget constraints have been a barrier to re the replication of the model in the Brazil. Let's talk about some risks, challenges, and opportunities for PPPs in the Brazilian prison sector. One major barrier for the development of PPPs in the prison sector is the lack of convergence, of alignment, of the granting authorities, stakeholders on project, basic strategic objectives. Lack of convergence of public and private partners on project strategic objectives. Trans transfer of risks that private partners cannot manage successfully, such as rebellions, riots, acts of indiscipline, escapes, and trial of drugs, etc. Another barrier is subjective performance me measurement leading to administrative proceedings and judicial 
processes. Unfortunately, this has been very common in Brazil. Risk of subjective performance measurement since the independent auditor is higher by the granting authority in many cases. Is low in costly dispute resolution mechanisms. Lack of program and project assessment so as to hinder investment decision making processes and the allocation of public resources. Lack of PPP policies at municipal, state and federal level affecting project modeling and increasing transaction costs for the companies. Lack of skills in project and risk management in granting authority, delaying contract in negotiations and claim management. And finally, ideological vision of groups opposed to the PPP, which not be confronted due to the lack of consistent program assessment policies. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'll be able to answer questions. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for finishing in time and uh, also for a very, very interesting practical presentation on a, a certain type of uh, PPP, which is not unusual. I mean, it's, it's in other countries too with prisons. So you've given us the perspective firsthand. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And uh, Akin, uh, we can, shall we move over now to the Q&A? And uh, I think the questions, uh, Liz may correct me if I'm wrong, are in the chat rather than the Q&A. So there are a few questions that I can see. Liz, do you want to guide us? Are you okay to read yeah, out the questions? Yeah, that's fine. No problem at all. Yeah, we've, we've got a, a couple of um, comments and, and a couple of questions that have come in. So the first one is for Babak. Um, and the comment sort of question is, I wonder how we can build long term sustainability into the business model of a broadband PPP, given the mm -hmm. fast pace of technological advancements and unclear regu regulatory landscape for smart cities, particularly around new technologies. So that's for Babak. Yeah, very, that's from very Australia. Good. Babak, that's from Yonjian, who you who you met last year on another webinar. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Baba. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, a very, very good question. Uh, very good question, Yangjib. You know, the problem uh, that you you mentioned, it's pretty common even in the places that the technological pace is not that uh, rapid, but definitely for something like uh, smart technologies used for the broadband, it becomes more severe. And I think to some extent, Ashwin um, mentioned that a lot of those measures of, you know, adapt adaptability, that sort of, you know, the two A's that the Ashwin was talking about in as a solution. Uh, so I'll share with you what we can do about the broadband. Uh, definitely you need to determine the level of service that you anticipate over the next 10, 20 years. You need to have a baseline and part of that baseline you need to define what kinds of changes you might anticipate. For instance, keeping up with the new technologies and as those technologies become available or as new regulations comes in place, what kind of you know, risk sharing strategies we might have in place. And that's that's something, you know, negotiating kind of we are not kicking the can down the road. We just say that here are the rules of engagement when those things happen. And definitely the concessioner is responsible for the baseline. So there is a baseline cost that would happen in year 10, year 15, year 20 for modernizing the infrastructure. However, when new things happens, the public sector can come in and say, yeah, I mean, I want to upgrade here and then they would evaluate the new cost and come up with a fair price for that and sort of compare that with the baseline and the additional payment needs to be made in that case. 
I have to say, unfortunately, in the execution of that is not going to be that smooth. And but we have to acknowledge we cannot predict every little thing that might happen over the next 30 years. So rather than that, we should focus on establishing a good baseline based on key performance indicators and level of service. And then once things change, whether demand increase, whether the other um, technologies becomes in place or re regulatory changes are introduced, then we talk about that difference. We negotiate and the private sector has to come to the table for negotiation and the difference would be paid by the public sector. So that's what I've noticed in many of the, the cases around uh, emerging technologies. Thank you I, for the answer, Baba. Great answer. Uh, right, next one. Uh, could you read it out, please? It's from Dijan Simonovic. Ashwin. And the question is, is there consideration for transition to collaborative contracting rather than adversarial system we have now? Yeah, I think uh, I'll answer that very briefly. I think there's a lot of research that's been done on collaborative contracting on things like integrated uh, project delivery, alliancing and these kinds of things. Uh, so I think even without PPPs, I think there is potential to transition to collaborative contracting. But the third P in PPPs we sometimes forget stands for partnership, which essentially is supposed to uh, stand for bringing out the best of the public and the private sector. But the way we write our contracts, many of our contracts used to be extremely rigid. But the more we move over to flexible contracts, I think there is clearly a greater potential for uh, collaborative contracting within the PPP uh, framework. But let's also look at alliancing and IPD and all these other things as potential forms that we can bring in. Thank you, Ashwin. And uh, if I may just add to that, uh, your last few slides, in fact, rang bells with collaborative contracting for me because, as you know, it's one of my own pet areas. And you know the things about like relational contracting. Uh, so all those principles of relational contracting I saw in your last couple of slides when you say that we've got to sometimes renegotiate contracts. So we've got to be flexible. All those are words that come out. Or in collaborative contracting, relational contracting, and all the things you've said. Thank you. So over to Donna for the next question. Yep, the uh, the next question is uh, for anybody on our panel to answer. Uh, so the question is, are there any national laws on PPP in the country that the presenters come from? We have a PP law here in Ghana. So I think all have to answer one by one. <laughs> <laughs> so we start in order. Yeah, Albert, uh, would you like to go first in the country that uh, you come from? Is All right, uh, we are from Hong Kong and there isn't such a, 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 a ordinance as such, uh, but it's um, constituted on a project by project basis, like um, the uh, Cross Harbor Tunnel, uh, when the, it was the first ever uh, PPP project. Um, built in Hong Kong and uh, they do have their own um, um, legal framework uh, for it to uh, comply. Uh, but uh, in Hong Kong, there's also a government um, government agency called uh, the Efficiency Unit and they are the, in fact, um, uh, the primary um, government authority to uh, look after the regulatory uh, requirements uh, for PPP projects. So that is the current situation in Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah, so the next, uh, shall we ask Babak in going in order of speakers again about USA? Yeah, the in the US we have a saying that if you have been involved in one P3 projects, you have only C one P3 projects. So it's not, uh, uh, there's certainly efforts at national level, but there's no particular regulations or anything because most of the capital project delivery happens at the state level, at the uh, local level. So federal governments can design certain parameters, uh, but yeah, there are uh, some resources for example i am with the build america center we are a center uh, a consortium of universities maryland purdue stanford virginia tech and georgia tech we provide educational and research uh, and any outreach related to the p3 alternative contracting methods and 
uh, innovative financing mechanism for infrastructure. So we help entities across the country as much as we could. We have workshops, we provide uh, best practices, but at the end of the day, it's up to the state legislators, it's up to the local uh, governments to decide one way, uh, one way or the other. But yeah, the parameters and best practices of that by the US Department of Transportation defined, particularly the Built America Bureau, which the Build America Center is uh, uh, housed under the Build America Bureau, they are defining the best way uh, for public-private partnership and part of investment grading for the project. I mean, in, in fact, if, they, if the project wants to receive a TIFIA loan, which many of these large projects have to uh, get that is a low interest loan provided for uh, gap financing. So a lot of you know uh, entities apply for that. So once they get to that, there would be some standardization because the project needs to be investment graded. So and then therefore, yeah, you you would have to follow certain procedure. But yeah, there is not as much as you know we can see in some Commonwealth countries or like for example in our northern. Um, neighbors in Canada, they have uh, like infrastructure, Ontario or the Center for Public Private Partnership, which is more cohesive in the US is more kind of w w one at a time. And it's not just for transportation, then also other market sectors have their own sort of re regulations. But yeah, good, good question. I, we like we love a standardization because on the research side, it helps us to compare and take notes and do a good comparative assessment across different sectors and across different regions. OK, uh, thank I, you very much. I, I can answer Ashwin. very quickly. I think uh, in India, every state has its own. Most states have their own PPP acts, uh, but we don't have uh, uh, an act at the central national level. And are they pretty compatible? Are they pretty similar, the different state acts? It's quite interesting because each state copies from the previous states and adds something on. So you'll find that some of the more recent acts are probably a lot more uh, mature than the states that actually enacted them a little bit earlier. So in fact, doing a content analysis gives you a little bit of an interesting glimpse of how thinking on PPP has evolved. So thanks for that, Mohan. That's an interesting point. Yeah, PPP, uh, Ashwin, if I can just go one step further. So what, what if there's a, going to be a PPP project that straddles the first state that had the PPP Act and the last state that had the PPP Act? And if there's going to be a difference uh, between those two, the, there might be some incompatibility, right? If there's a yeah, but road that runs between. Absolutely, but those will probably not come under the state the, those projects will come under the national authority and right. uh, there again there's no act but each authority has its own sort of guidelines so the national highways authority has its playbook etc so luckily you don't get this conflict because each state as per the constitution has its own set of things it deals with and the moment there's something that's across states except in a few cases rivers that go through multiple states um, you know it's it's in the national interest so that conflict doesn't arise but it's an ex interesting sort of theoretical proposition as to what might uh, and, and it might be interesting later on if some of the earlier states revamped their act by uh, sort of learning from some of the later states. Yeah. OK, great. So I see that Leonardo has already put his uh, summary reply, uh, giving even the law number from 2004 that regulates PPP. But Leonardo, would you like to add to it to verbalize a bit more? Basically, the federal government passed the law back in 2004 and um, it was followed uh, by the state governments. And the state uh, state governments uh, have improved the federal law. But in Brazil, Brazil has a, a civil law framework. So a law is um, absolutely necessary to to concede um, legal certainty for the, 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 the private companies. That's why a, a law has had to be passed in Brazil. OK, great. Um, Albert, uh, I just wonder whether you want to say anything about the PPP law in China moving a little bit beyond. I know, well, Hong Kong, as you said, uh, we have ordinance for each PPP project, so which passes the let's call the equivalent of a parliament. 
and uh, but uh, if you take China as a whole, would you want to comment anything about the law or regulations that govern that, Albert? Yeah, uh, there are laws and regulations governing the operation of PPP in mainland China. In fact, I note that uh, uh, Professor Yong Jian Ke is uh, amongst the um, audience um, in this um, forum. And uh, I'm sure that Yong Jian would be able to provide a more detailed um, um, uh, comment on this. He just typed and say that uh, there is no national PPP uh, law in mainland yes. China. Interesting question. And uh, I just can add to that because I, I happened to attend a, a PPP webinar by coincidence today, another international one with speakers from UK, uh, Australia and the Middle East. And it was organized by Pins and Masons. It was about four hours ago and I, I attended that one. And uh, in that one, the speaker from the Middle East said that the PPP uh, market in Middle East is now ripe for takers. So they have matured and which is what is very relevant to the question asked is that the speaker said that um, trying to see the name of the speaker that I have it here. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's Tim Armsley. Uh, Tim Armsley, he said that, uh, he, so he's based in one of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, and he said that every country in the Middle East now has its own PPP law. So it's matured to that extent, and there's a lot of interest and a lot of money still, of course, uh, for those who are interested. Okay, this, this is organized by a law firm, Vincent Masons, who some of you may know. Uh, so they are into the legal aspects of this. So it's good for financiers, lawyers, apart from uh, infrastructure guys like us. Uh, so it, it's it's something from the Middle East. Well, some other countries may have their regulations, like some of us said. Uh, some do have laws. Okay, uh, so do we want to? Uh, any other questions, Donna? The next question is for Ashwin um, and the question is how do you think this will make PPP attractive to private sector if they have to be responsible for the carbon footprint in the contract? Yeah, I think Akim has asked that question and it's obviously a, a very important and relevant question because if the, if the private sector cannot make, make the returns that they expect, then why would they sort of come forward? Uh, so I think there are a couple of ways to look at it. One is, of course, they need to be compensated for what they're doing. So either user charges are set at a rate that compensates them, or if it's government paying some kind of a availability or annuity payment, those payments are also tagged to these kinds of costs. Or the private sector is given incentives such as being able to trade carbon credits that they actually save or earn in, in the market and, and try to sort of generate revenue uh, as well, in some cases, you know, you might naturally, if you're recycling water and so on, um, uh, and you have more energy efficient buildings, things like that, you might end up actually saving money. So I think it's a mix of all of this. I think theoretically it's possible uh, that the private sector can be incentivized to do this by an appropriate mixture of payments, um, say, you know, uh, expense saving mechanisms, as well as ability to trade on carbon markets and so on. But the devil's in the details. I think each of those projects one needs to sit, work out, uh, talk to the private sector to understand the kind of risk premium they're putting on these kinds of things and um, you know, and then sort of see if you can come up with a concession agreement that will uh, allow the private sector to come in without overburdening somebody else like the government or the user. OK, we have um, uh, some more questions. Um, the next one is for anybody on the panel to answer. Uh, so the question is on sustainability of PPPs. Why do debates centre around economic and environmental aspects while the social dimension is neglected? And that's for anybody to answer. I well, I, I will hazard uh, uh, an answer at that. I And I, I think it's Primarily because when you look at environment, uh, economic environment and social, the ability to measure outcomes is more difficult as you go down that chain. Economics, I think we understand now how to do discounted cash flow calculations, etc. So it's easy to measure. Now with all of these tools in terms of life cycle analysis, etc., carbon footprints, we are starting to measure the environmental aspects. 
but I think the social aspects are are really challenging to measure, and they're all these sort of uh, you know interconnected. You know, as Albert was saying, there's sort of a systemic nature to these kinds of things that is very difficult to tease out, and I think that's why we probably haven't gotten to that just yet. If I may jump in while other panel, well, other speakers are thinking of the answer. I mean, I. I'm grateful to Grace for asking this question uh, because uh, I, I too had a, had a similar feeling a few years ago, well, many years ago. Uh, so 2008, I did publish a paper in a conference and then we had a couple of students working on what we call the fourth P, the people. So that ties up with the social aspect um, and make the fourth P in, P in uh, PPP. So the four P is public, private, people partnership. And there you get the the actual end users really involved from the start, from the front end. So you do build in the social aspects. So if interested, you can look at some. It's not, not just me. There are others uh, like Hemant and Deloy who have also independently published on 4P and all, so bringing the people into the uh, partnership. Uh, so going beyond 3P to 4P and uh, looking at and trying to incorporate the social dimension. Anyone else on the from one, the uh, one thing I can add, Mohan, at least in the broadband, the whole uh, the whole point to use uh, PPP model, the P3 model, the whole point of that is to address equity issues. So these are the parts that the, there was market failure. There are areas underserved areas as well as, you know, uh, the areas of low income that, you know, they simply there is not enough uh, subscription subscription fee the revenue that coming from that is not enough for because otherwise all of these big players in the market would have expanded to that area when the demand was not there then the public has to step up for the social equity matter so the whole use of that ppp model for broadband in the us for the most part uh, is uh, motivated by by the social equity the other way is uh, also, uh, this is in trial mode and have not been experienced a lot in the industry, but in the US there is sort of a nuance now introduced that communities also invest in these projects, like becomes at least somehow a partner, equity partner, a small junior kind of equity partner in some of these P3. So part of that return on equity comes back to the community one way or the other. And that's that's something I noticed as it has potential value uh, in terms of building a coalition and support for the PPP projects, which is very important. And and regardless of that, you know, as a matter of the fact, a lot of the operators and p3 uh, uh, spvs they already invest a lot for mar uh, for community engagements and marketing the projects and sending the message to the community so rather than uh, spending all of that money there would they would say you know uh, why not the the community becomes an equity stakeholders and therefore part of that uh, revenue generated goes back to the community for some other projects or just some as a re return on their investment. So I see this also address some of the social equity in, a, in an innovative way. I would like to see more of that, quite frankly. It's sort of a, the idea could be like a crowdfunding of the infrastructure. So we have some uh, small samples of that here and there, the crowdfunding of infrastructure, uh, of course, for billion dollar projects maybe it's n n nothing but for the smaller size projects might be something significant thank you baba so um yeah so that that's a good reminder that there are elements of uh, social uh, concern and uh, consideration in the existing ppps and i suppose that's the job of the public sector to build in those uh, uh, those considerations uh, because they're supposed to look after social welfare so it may be there, although not explicitly so, uh, through the public sector. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, maybe we should move on to the second question from, from the same uh, uh, person, from Grace. Uh, Donna, would you want to read it out? 
Yep, so the second question is again for anybody on the panel to answer. And the question is, why is ex post evaluation of PPPs lacking regardless of PPPs being around for decades? Now that question is uh, assuming that there is no ex post evaluation, which uh, uh, some of us may not totally agree with, but over to anyone from the panel to uh, the speakers rather to uh, yeah. answer that question. Now I was going to say what you just said, Mohan. I think there is some amount of exposed evaluation, at least. I think various governments do these reviews periodically. It's happened in the UK and elsewhere. I think the more important question is, are the learnings from the exposed evaluation being fed into the next generation of PPPs? And I think that's where sometimes there is a gap, um, you know, in that in that process. Thank you. Uh, so again, while while waiting for the other speakers, if anyone wants to add anything, in fact, the webinar I mentioned that uh, that I attended this afternoon um, from Pinson Masons. In fact, that was the topic of the webinar, and it was uh, there was a report just released uh, this year. It's uh, called. Let me see. <laughs> uh, okay, it's called the uh, White Frazier Report. And uh, it was uh, done on the PFIs in mm -hmm. the UK. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's called the White Frazier Report and published in, in July 2023. So it is an exposed evaluation of the whole uh, PFI program in the UK. And it's, uh, it's under discussion where they have come out with some lessons learned and they've called for a reset. So I got the executive summary in front of me. Um, and so there are some things going on. Um, and they've come out with some interesting points from the UK point of view, but this was discussed globally and uh, as I said, from Australia and Middle East as well. So any other one, any other speaker wants to add to this on exposed evaluations of PPPs? If not, we can move on to the next question, Donna. If you can. Yeah, do you want me to move on to the next question then or? Yeah, if we can no. have this as the yeah, last okay. or last but one question so that we can finish yes sometime, yeah. okay yes. yeah okay so next question is um can i ask if you believe that state-owned enterprises uh, participating in ppp as government counterparties may be a sustainable business model or not and that's open to the entire panel assuming when you say government counterparties um if i guess the implication is that they are the concession f so the government provides a concession to a state-owned uh, enterprise, in which case I think it sort of depends on the state-owned enterprise. Uh, in certain parts of the world, you have corporatized entities that more or less have their responsibilities to their own balance sheets and so on, in which case they behave more or less like the private sector and can bring in the efficiencies and all of that that you want to get out of a PPP. But if that's not the case, then I might at first glance question whether that would actually constitute a PPP or not. Again, it's possible that you see that a lot in China yeah. where you see state owned yes. companies who are in the, who are acting like private sector investor or contractors. You see that a lot. Uh, maybe that is what you are trying to allude to. But again, uh, whether you can regard that as, as a PPP or public public partnership where they come together to be able to do business together. Um, again, you see also the same state enterprise going into many countries operating like a private sector in many countries. Particularly, you see that in a lot of that in Africa, where you see a lot of public publicly owned companies in China coming to Africa in many countries and they operate as if they are a kind of private organization. Maybe that is what you are trying to think about. I don't know. In, in my opinion, the participation of state owned enterprise in the PPPs brings about important governance and uh, compliance issues due to potential conflicts of uh, interests which must be addressed by the granting authority in case by cases, uh, in case by case basis. Um, but but it's very common in Brazil in water supply and treatment uh, sector, the participation of state owned enterprises in uh, this sector. 
However, it um, hinders the competition process for the bids. That's why I, I think that um, the participation of state-owned enterprises in Brazilian scenario uh, brings about some important uh, uh, governance issues. But in, in Brazilian scenario, can we just pick this last question from uh, Albert? You know, again because uh, you mentioned about the system dynamics and how you've used that to be able to look at risk and to be able to do uh, do a kind of assessment of risk. The project you have done has it gone beyond that to be able to look at? Okay, we've identified this risk through the system dynamics or, right. or system thinking. Who sure. take over what? Uh does that go yeah. to that thank, level? Thank, thank you for the question. I think this is a very valid one. And uh, by um, classifying the risk into different levels, it provides us with a much better picture of what some major risks are and which level they are in. And in fact, um, the results of our finding is the highest level of the risk is for force majeure risk. And the second level risk um, related to government or political liability, regulatory framework, as well as legal and regulatory changes. Now, um, our, our common wisdom tells us that you know um, allocation of risk would be best allocated to the party who are the most able to manage the risk. Now, looking at the level two risks, they are all uh, related to government uh, regulatory uh, issues. So um, that definitely uh, would uh, point some um, the tendency to uh, the government to take um, the higher responsibility in um, being allocated um, in managing those risks. Whereas for the uh, level three risks, which is force majeure, which is uh, by definition beyond um, the anticipation of either party so perhaps uh, that risk should be um, uh, equally um, uh, um, um, allocated or being um, um, avoided or assigned to a third party now as for the most fundamental level one uh, risks they are primarily related to uh, the operation and uh, um, the capability and the competence of um, those uh, um, concessionaires. So that um, would um, uh, perhaps uh, be better allocated to the contractor side. So uh, I would suggest that, you know, by identifying the different levels of risks, um, we would be able uh, to tell which risks would be uh, of more influential nature. And we really need to look into the individual risks. Uh, which party would be better able to handle the risk and manage the risk, and then that party should take uh, a higher share of managing that particular risk. So that is um, our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I think we within, we should be finishing within the next few minutes. Uh, again, um, is there anything you want to say, Mwan, before I wrap, wrap it up? Thank you, sorry. Yeah, uh, nothing except to. Um, I'm sure you're going to thank all the uh, the, the speakers, but I'll, I'll do it here now, and also thank all those who ask questions for enabling and uh, facilitating a lively chat and keeping us going and awake in different parts of the world. So um, yeah, I can. Uh, I think the Q and A session uh, was to me very useful and uh, revealing, educational. So. Uh, Maybe we are moving close to the scheduled time of closure, and I know that uh, some of us uh, have already sent messages uh, saying that they want to leave. Of course, we could go on for a few more minutes if there's something uh, very interesting. So I'll, I think we'll end the Q&A session and hand over to you, Akin. Um, thank you for for your contributions, particularly our speakers. Again, uh, you've try to give us uh, a lot of exposition about how PPP should operate and also what are the issues and also the case study also is important around the prison and also in terms of the uh, band uh, uh, telephone situation. We, we've seen all this. These are all 
fantastic work that you are doing. On behalf of the CIB 122, I would like to say thank you uh, for your contribution. I'm sure also our delegates, the uh, people that have come and have stayed with us, again, thank you for, for the time that you have spent with us. And also to Liz and Donna, again, thank you for anchoring this. Uh, Don, thank you everyone. I think what came out of this for me is the fact that we need to have a bit of flexibility. And you mentioned about adaptability as well because of changes that are taking place. How will PPP respond to all those changes? And we need to have that within the contract for it, for it to remain current. Otherwise, it becomes so difficult to manage. And we're also saying that public sector might not have the resources to adapt to all the technological changes that are taking place. But the private sector is in their own interest to continue to make sure that the technology or the issues they need to address, they remain current. And maybe that is where we need to look at how public and private sector, how they continue to work together. I think the, the key word that is mentioned by Ashwin is around partnership working together in partnership, having the same shared goals is important, and to have trust as well. That collaboration uh, and the spirit of collaboration to be there is important when we are dealing with partnership. And we know that there are many areas where we have received failure of this system. Again, uh, I'm hoping that we can continue this in a different way, and also we can continue this discussion and debate. Again, thank you everyone for coming, and I know that you all have to go now. Uh, we, we've been going out for uh, for uh, uh, for two hours. Thank you, and one again. Thank you for for the uh, for for chairing the session again. Thank you, everyone. Leonardo, it's good to see you again. I see you one of these days again. Uh, um, Albert, uh, Ashwin, uh, Don, all of you. Thank you for for the wonderful work and your preparation. The time you have taken to prepare for this again. Thank you for all those. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thanks again. Okay, thanks, then, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank now. you, everyone. Okay, okay. And one time, wait a bit. Yeah, okay, then. Thank you.